Well, we know we've done a couple videos for part one, but what about part two? Should I think we take it's a look? Just important, absolutely. Oh, I think there's a lot of photos recognizing high yield photos. So, what comes to your mind when you see something like this? That it's not good. <laughs> it's not good. Optic nerve macula. Is that one of those macular star things there? It is. Which. And it does have that that pattern. It's all that exudate. Um, that nerve is pretty swollen. Quite. Very much so. I could be tempted to say neuroretinitis. I could also be tempted to say hypertension could be a problem here. Am I on the right track? Absolutely. I think malignant hypertension is an absolute great differential, but neuroretinitis isn't bad either. So blood pressure probably would be really important for us to take here. Well, let's take a look at that. So mild, moderate, and severe or malignant. Is this referring to hypertensive retinopathy now? This is. This is. So we can look at the actual diastolic blood pressure measurements and anything greater than 90 or less than 110. Why can't that just say between 90 to 110? Because then that'd be really easy. <laughs> <laughs> but mild, increased ALR. Oh, now i got to remember what this stands for. ALR. Attenuated, attenuated light reflex. Got it. Okay. So you don't see the light reflex as well. It's attenuated, suppressed. You got it. <laughs> AV ratio changes, crossing changes, moderates, start to see hard exit aids. I've always thought of exit aids as being wherever there's been fluid in the retina. Is that a fair thought Yeah, process? I like that. I like that. And then malignant greater than or equal to 110. That, ooh, that is, that's high. So you see this, what are you doing? Well, <laughs> got to get that blood pressure down. Okay. Setting them out for yeah. blood pressure control. And I think that's where we look at some of the treatments for blood pressure. Yeah, I really like this because I think that this is a great way, again, when you're looking at your drug list and your patients come into the clinic to make sure that you are asking and correlating what med they're on with the condition that you're actually seeing. These are some of the most common ones. So remember ACE inhibitors with prills and that's side effect is a cough. Um, <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Prill. Okay. Uh, you what? got your angiotensin antagonists, um, your calcium antagonists, your alpha-1 antagonists, and your thiazide diuretics. There's one of each just for you to remember what families they're in, but definitely worth looking um, looking over and recognizing that these are all hypertensive medications. I like that. That's a good breakdown for that. Let's move on to another case. I'm seeing two optic nerves. That's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> right eye and left eye, perhaps. Both look problematic. Look a little swollen. Even the left eye, you've got some hemes there. Now, isn't that one of the rules of optic nerve edema? If it's in both eyes, we can finally call it papilledema. Close. Oh, Close. Did I go too far? You I went got... too far. You oh. got to reel it back. Reel it back. So, Help me. This patient walks into your office. You dilate them. You see bilateral disc edema. Ah. It is bilateral disc edema until proven a Otherwise. Cause. Yeah. And to call it papilledema, to take it that far, we'd have to say it's from increased intracranial pressure. You got it. Like, okay, so I, I did take it too far. Let's take a look. Well, what would cause this then? Uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension is a good differential. But remember, there's got to be three things that we are looking for if you want to call it that. And it is one that it is swollen disc in the presence of increased intracranial pressure. It is somebody who has had an MRI first. You always do the image before the lumbar puncture. So a diagnosis of exclusion. Somewhat. Absolutely. Like rule out tumors and bad things first. Correct. Then let's move on and say it might be IIH. Right. But even then need lumbar puncture. You got it. Because okay. if you lumbar puncture before you MRI, you probably are going to risk a chance of brain herniation, which really isn't good. That's not a chance I want to take. Um, and then the CSS contents have to be elevated and they have to um, be clean. So there's no infection. So you're really not any type of meningitis or anything like that. Got it. Okay. I like that. And those are the three right there. So on the screen for us, papilledema due to increased intracranial pressure, negative MRI, and then increased opening pressure. So I love that. That's very important. And we do see this. It seems to be sometimes younger women who may be overweight. We see this happening. There's different medications that can cause this also in some cases. And treatment ultimately is Dimox, acetazolamide. Uh, and that can be prescribed to try to help with this papilledema situation. What would you uh, dose that at? If you were to prescribe it. Going out on a limb here, 
500 milligrams twice a day? Absolutely. Is that right? Yeah. I, <laughs> you got it. I either was right or I killed my patient. So I'm glad I was right. Um, can't? You can't <sighs> ignore this. <laughs> because this is what causes this. Absolutely. Medications. You're going to quiz me now. What does the C stand for? I am. Oh, man. I am. Because these are, this is a mnemonic for, to, for you to think about medications that put the patient at risk for this kind of condition. Can so, I skip the C and go to A and say sure. vitamin A? Vitamin A. Can I skip the N and go to T and say tetracycline? You got it. Uh, it's your turn. So this, <laughs> now that we've got the at, <laughs> the C is contraceptive, so oral contraceptives. The N is al analidixic acid. Okay. And then the S could actually be one of two things. So this could be can't. <laughs> I like that. Uh, synthroid. Okay. For thyroid. That would be pretty rare, I think. Yes. But it could happen. Um, and the other one would be uh, sertraline. Sertraline? Sertraline. That's sertraline. probably a way more fancy. Uh, antidepressant. A.K.A. Zoloft. Zoloft. Got it. Okay. Can'ts. I like those. Oh. I, that just screams to me. I want to ask the patient, what's your A1C? What's your sugar level? I agree with you. I agree with you. What what on there makes that... Uh, I see hemes in four quadrants. I see exudates all over the place. I just, to me, I just, it's screaming diabetes. They've got to have diabetes. I would assume we'd see this in both eyes also, because it'd be likely to be bilateral. Oh, yeah. So, diabetes. I, <laughs> what? <laughs> you just said that it screamed at you. That's what the retina screams when you see that. So, like, when you're... Let me listen again. Di diabetes. It did. I heard it that see? time. Yeah. Uh, NPDR, non-proliferative, diabetic. Of course, if you saw a vitreous hemorrhage or if you saw any neovascularization, we're in the proliferative. This is non, right? So we have diabetes. <laughs> now, I will say you came up or you were telling me about a really cool way to help remember the 421 rule in case somebody was like, okay, four quadrants of blank, two quadrants of blank. I take full, give full credit to Dr. Olson. I stole it from her. Four quadrants of hemes. H has four points on the H. A V has two points, so two quadrants of venous beating. I, I suppose, has one point at the top, and that's one quadrant of Irma, and that would be severe, 4 to one I love that. Yeah, it worked out all right. Oh, just like a little fun photo diagnosis. I see vitreous, snug on the macula, on the fovea, and that's attraction, uh, vitreo macular traction. VMT? VMT. That's all we want to say about it. I hope you got it too. <laughs> Anything else we wanted to add about this one? Um, that if you... No, I got nothing. I was... Yeah. Moving on. Let's go. Let's go. Ooh. Oh. My, this is one of my favorites. Like, you like seeing it? Oh, absolutely. Actually, what I really love about this condition is, one, it's pretty... Um, there's a beautiful triad in anything that has a triad. I love. <laughs> got another right? triad. Got to. Um, but I also think that there is a... Um, this is where patients think you're a magician because oh. what happens is, as you go into the room, you take a look at the back part of your eye, you see these punched out lesions or the histospots. Okay. You see this peripapillary atrophy, and then you see this macalopathy, which has a potential to have that CNBM. And then you sit back after you take your BIO off and you go, Hey, do you happen to be from the Ohio Mississippi river Valley? And then they go, Oh my, how did, <laughs> how did you, you know, know that? <laughs> and then you're like, you know, if you really want to freak them out, take their palm first, look at it. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then you collect extra money for being a fortune teller also and knowing their past, present and future. So that you didn't actually diagnose this, though. You're right. I didn't. So I love that patient, for you. Not, no, not, you're the doctor in oh, this yeah, scenario. Thinking. And the patient says, so what do I have then, doctor? You have presumed oculo, ocular histoplasmosis. If you're such a good fortune teller, why is it presumed? Why is it not just histoplasmosis? Because that's my, not my day job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, there's your triad. Yellow, white, punched out, round lesions, histospots, macular CNV, and peripapillary atrophy. <gasps> you got it. Go for it. Uh, please. Okay. I, I just, I really wanted to emphasize the difference between this and some, maybe some other conditions is that there is no vitritis present. And I wanted to throw that in here because everybody memorizes the triad. However, your general rule should be triad plus two, because on the off chance, you might have to come up with more than three. You don't want to be sitting at that question feeling so confident and then immediately deflated because maybe you get four of the five. Mm. So mm -hmm. 
I like that. And that's going to contrast from... Oh, wait. First, we got to treat it. Antifungals, Amphotericin B, Itraconazole, and possibly Anti-VEGF for CNV or Laser PRP for any extrafovial outside of the fovea CNV. Yes, because this is a fungal infection. <sighs> Nailed it. Woohoo! That feels like I'm seeing some vitritis. So that maybe couldn't be histo. Oh, wait. We're driving through the fog. It's headlights in the fog, isn't it? Headlights in the fog. Toxoplasmosis. You crushed it. Great job. Headlights in the fog. Parasite. A parasitic infection. Toxoplasma. (laughs) Toxoplasmosis. That's what I get at lunch at Del Taco. That sounds... I don't know if I can eat tacos and look at these pictures, but... um, (laughs) Parasitic infection. My favorite thing that comes up about these is usually, you know, it's cat feces. So yes. if you have a cat, would you get rid of your cat? Oh, I would never, my kids ask for a cat all the time and I say, absolutely not. No cat, no cat in the house. No. Don't get your cats to a shelter. <laughs> <laughs> and some treatments now. Pyrimethamine and folinic acid, sulfadiazine, pred? Probably for the inflammation. <laughs> okay. All right, topical steroid, topical ILP reducer, other things. Uh, and if severe or patient is immunocompromised, treat the macular area. Um, and then remember with this condition, the scar, which is the headlight that you're seeing through the vitritis, which is the fog, mm-hmm. um, that scar can either be active or latent. So you can actually have the scar and then, you know, just sometime during your life, start to have conditions or symptoms. Um, it can also be passed via the placenta, so um, this can be congenital as well. So no cat when you have kids, no cat even before you have kids. Just no cat. All right. Uh, I, ooh, I love eyelids. I do. I feel sad when patients have this happen. That looks like it's probably uncomfortable. At first glance, I almost thought bug bite, but a bug bite could probably lead to this also, where it looks like the area I'm presuming in front of the septum is infected. I don't know yet until I get a little more history, so maybe I need some history to really guide me. So what if we look at this? No VA loss, no proptosis, no painful EOMs, no APD, no neuropathy. I'm feeling much better about this being in front of the septum. If any of those were not true, I'm worried about an orbital. Send them to the hospital, get on oral IV antibiotics. But are you, does that work? Am I thinking about this the right way? Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, you know, that, that preceptal cellulitis. So um, if any of these turn from a no to a yes, would you consider sending them? I'd have to keep it on my differential. You're, but but, but right, VA loss is a good one, right? I mean, you could have goop in the eye, mucus in the eye. Good point. They might have VA loss from that. So it's like, I think you have to look at these all together and look at the, 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 the history, the course of this disease. But good question. This is a tough one. This one comes up a lot with orbital, preceptal, and other things, masqueritis also. I mean, even you could look at that and say, is that a contact dermatitis? Yes. So there's so many things that look similar, but history, history is key. Uh, And ultimately, antibiotic. Augmentin has an isillin, like penicillin. So if a patient has penicillin penicillin allergy, I might avoid that one. That's a really good point. Um, and if you were thinking about what you dose your augmentin for for preceptal cellulitis, how much would you give your patient? I think we're limited usually to about 500 milligrams twice a day or 875 twice a day. So for this, let's just say probably 500 milligrams twice a day. Awesome. And when, would, when might you think Keflex? Or maybe when might you... Um, you just said it. Don't worry about it. Well, guys. no. But we got to know what class of drug is Keflex in. It's a cephalosporin, and so we would probably be safe with Keflex if they had a penicillin allergy, right? Yeah, you I'm got feeling it. good about that one. Uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> this one. Oh. Well, we got two very different presentations. I mean, but it's very accurate because I even see these pustular lesions around the face, the nose, some telangiectasia, rhinophyma. Which is what? What does that mean? That hardened, enlarged, red nose. Do you think that's where rhinophyma come from? Because rhinos have such thick, like, skin, which is kind of that... Well, and a rhinoceros, their nose, right? It's got to be rhino, rhino, rhinoceros, rhinophyma. We got stuck on that one too long. 
<laughs> what are we? And the telangiectasia on the face too. When I see this in the dry clinic, I'm thinking I want to do IPL on this patient. Ooh. Intense pulse light. And when I see this in my clinic, I think I'm going to refer to Dr. Kenworthy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the referral. And did you try tetracycline on your patient yet? No, but maybe a since you're getting pretty booked up with all these referrals I'm sending you, I will try that first. But what would I think about with a tetracycline? Who maybe shouldn't I give that to? Should there be any contraindications or what? Absolutely. The concern I have, like is mentioned here, is children, uh, also expectant mothers, mm, I think would be one. a concern with tetracycline as well. Do you usually give your patients a warning that maybe they might have some GI issues, stomach upset? Yes, yes. Um, Mm -hmm. So I know with Doxy, you know, we talk to patients about not being able to go out, you know, or be very mindful about being in the sun uh -huh. because of sunburn. Is that the whole cyclin family? I don't know. That's a good question. I'll have to look that up. I would think, I would assume so. I'm not totally sure. Okay. Good, well, good thought. Good if, question. You know, thinking about Doxy. But Doxy would probably be the main one, main one in the tetracycline. Oh, and well, we know been. that. So <laughs> save you the, save you the Google. <laughs> Guys, I hope this was, um informative, helpful. <laughs> at least you feel as lost as we do sometimes, but you're getting there one step at a time. Keep on studying. You've got this. It's coming soon. What you learn now is going to help you all in the future. So keep it up. We're proud of you. You got this. You go, do. Go get them.